Hey there. Hello. So my best friend and I were playing Super Smash Brothers the other day. Awesome. I love that game. Yeah, it was great. I wanted to tell you about our final matchup because yeah. we chose some great characters. <laughs> Who'd you pick? All right. So I got obsessed with the Duck Hunt dog. He's so cute. Okay. I don't think I've literally ever played him. He's great. He's just so stupid looking. Mm -hmm. And like his main <laughs> attack is just like him pawing out with his big stupid paw. It's Aww. great. <laughs> and his like up B jump move is like the duck flying, but he's carrying him by his butt. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then Sarah played Zelda. Shout out to Sarah. And then we were playing against, this is where it gets good. We decided to play against, we found a Mario skin that has like, it's like a flag. It's like the American flag. Oh yeah, the <laughs> Uncle Sam Mario. <laughs> yeah, so we picked that and then we combined it. Our, our other opponent was Dr. Mario, but in all black. So we decided we were playing against the US healthcare system. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mario, like Undertaker style? Mm -hmm, sort of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, wait, actually, Sarah changed to be Fox. So we decided it was dogs versus healthcare. Dogs versus health. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we can all recognize the revolutionary potential of dogs, I think. Yeah. The bad news <laughs> is we did lose that last round. Oh, well, in your defense, you were dogs. <laughs> we were just dogs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are you supposed to do? Uh, that's great. We did our best. All right. You want to get into it? Yeah, what are you teaching me today? Today, you're going to learn about Lenin. Okay, I've heard a lot about this guy. It seems like people think he was very good or very bad. Vladimir Lenin, yeah, people, mm, yeah, they usually have a take on this guy. <laughs> Polarizing. What have you heard about him? Besides, like, what we've talked about on here, like, what's the kind of, mm. I guess, the man on the street sort of <laughs> view here? Oh, let me just Let me just exit my door. <laughs> and go find someone. <laughs> um, let me see. So, let's see. I mean, he's a Russian guy, mm -hmm. and he was this, like, revolutionary. And people said that he killed a lot of people, I think. I think people get people, and by people, I mean me before this podcast, <laughs> get him and Stalin mixed up a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, that can happen. Or just kind of a broad, painting with a broad brush and saying, you know, anything the Soviet Union does, that's kind of all of them, right? That's mm -hmm. Stalin, that's Trotsky, that's Lenin, anybody, it's their fault. Definitely, yeah. As everyone knows, we usually blame, you know, the nuking of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on, on George Washington. Um, that's typically who gets that blame. <laughs> he totally did it. <laughs> but no, I mean, we'll get into it, but Lenin definitely does kill some folks. Not personally. I don't think he ever personally kills anyone, but uh, he got them killed. Has some people killed, yeah. Yeah, okay. But anyway, let's uh, let's jump in because there's a lot here. Okay, tell me about him. All right, so Lenin, let's start at the top. Lenin, he was born April 22nd, 1870. That's a long time ago. Got it. Right. And it's kind of helpful. I like that he's got a nice even year so that you mm -hmm. can, as you're reading through, be like, oh man, he was only whatever. <laughs> That's a good point. So yeah, this is what, five years after the U.S. Civil War? <laughs> uh, Yeah, yep. <laughs> this guy was born. That's crazy. Uh, he's born to Ilya Ulyanov. Okay. That's his father. He's actually Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov is his real mm. name. Oh, he changed his name. Mm -hmm. Lenin is kind of a nom de guerre. Cute. Yeah, he came up with that. His father, Ilya Ulyanov, and his mother, Maria Ulyanova. I was making a face because I was like trying to remember where I know the name Ilya from, and I realized it's from this dorky visual novel that I read, so... Shout out to the Arcana if anyone plays that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, he's got kind of humble-ish roots. Uh, not so humble, really. Um, his father had grown up poor. His father before him, like Lenin's grandfather, was a serf mm -hmm. who had eventually been granted his freedom, uh, kind of became a tailor, but was still like basically broke. This is grandpa? Yeah, grandpa. Okay, okay. So, so Ilya grew up basically broke. Uh, he kind of was able to do enough for himself to get a university degree in physics and math. Damn. That's when he marries Maria Blank, who has the opposite of an upbringing. She was just raised rich. Okay. Uh, so um, Lennon's mom is definitely, you know, kind of from that wealthier life, grew up on a country mm -hmm. estate, 
uh, tutored in languages and literature, eventually like becomes an elementary school teacher before settling down with Ilya. Okay. By 1882, so Lenin's 12 at that point, uh, Ilya had risen from being like just a high school math and physics teacher to the post of director of public schools and active state counselor. Whoa. Giving him the title of a hereditary noble. What? <laughs> it's a weird thing, but um, but basically once you reach that point, like in the civil service working for the government, you would get a title. You'd become That's hereditary crazy. noble. So he's like a very minor, but still a noble technically. Mm -hmm. Fancy. So yeah, like the point of bringing all this up, I guess, is young Volodya, as he would be called. That was like that's the diminutive of Vladimir. Mm, okay, okay. And his siblings, they were raised in a thoroughly well-to-do middle-class household. Mm -hmm. they, and this is pretty upper middle class, but he's in that middle mm -hmm. class sort of thing. And they've got like land from his mom's family. Uh, they holiday in the summer at a manor in the country. Ooh. Yeah, like his parents. Okay, rich boy. Yeah. His parents are inoffensive politically. They're like moderate liberals, reformists, mm -hmm. kind of. They support the emancipation of serfs, but they also support like the monarchy. Okay, yeah. I was going to ask how they felt about the czar. Yeah, they were fine with that. They thought that was good. <laughs> cool. When Tsar Alexander II in 1881 gets assassinated. They're horrified. His father attends the memorial. You know, it's just a very surprising origin, I guess, for such a firebrand revolutionary. Yeah, I'm picturing, I assume his parents die before he, like, does crazy shit. Uh, his father does. Okay, because that'd be really funny if, like, you have... Because, like, I feel like olden times, you know, people's parents died younger. Mm -hmm. So, like, you wouldn't have them being like, oh, my son is a crazy revolutionary. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, they're, like, embarrassed of him or something. Right. Well, if you remember Engels, like, his, he always had a kind of an argument with his parents when oh, he was yeah. a young man getting radicalized and stuff. And they were like, please stop that. <laughs> parents just don't understand. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he he has uh, several siblings. They're not super crucial. <laughs> Boring. The one that will come into play is uh, Alexander. Okay. Anna is also kind of important. She's helping throughout the revolution, but they're basically in the background. Okay. Everyone but Alexander, who we'll get into here. So overall, as a child, it seems Lenin was kind of a nerd. Ugh, classic. Well, he was more of a brainiac. See, like, he would still go, he, like, loved the outdoors. He would be active and everything and do all that. He just, you know, also got really good grades. He was a nerd in that sense. Okay. Good at everything. Uh, Yeah, kind of, but not <laughs> everything, everything. We'll get into his pros and cons here, I think. They'll, they will unfold. <laughs> <laughs> In January 1886, Lennon's dad, Ilya, died of a brain hemorrhage. Okay. So Lennon's 16 at the time. Yeah. He becomes more angsty, more moody. He renounces his belief in God. Damn. And you know, says, I've had it up to here, basically. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And that same year, tragedy strikes again his older brother, Alexander. Then a standout student at Petersburg University, he starts reading radical literature like Marx. <gasps> his brother got him into it? That sounds yeah. familiar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So he starts reading this radical literature. Um, and he's at, he's at university where they're actually facing like a lot of crackdowns from the government. The government hates the university students, because it sees mm -hmm. them as like a potentially radical threat. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they've got all these rules and stuff, and he becomes kind of an activist. He st joins up with a cell of this illegal group called Narodnaya Volya, which translates okay. to People's Will, the People's Will oh, Party. Nice. Yeah. Um, they do some terrorism. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not as nice. So in 1887, his group plots to assassinate the Tsar, Tsar Alexander III. Oh, shit. They're going to throw a bomb at him, blow him up, boom. Uh, they all get arrested before they can carry out their plot. <laughs> Whoops. Anna, Lenin's older sister, also gets arrested because she kind of like helped them out, like maybe past oh. messages, but she wasn't in the plot. In the plot. Yeah. So hers yeah. is a separate thing. She gets, you know, a trial and is exiled for five years. Shit. But Alexander, his trial is really brief. He's put on trial with the other 15 uh, defendants. He not only admits his guilt, but also basically tries to say it was all him. Oh, wow. So that, you know, his comrades can can go free or whatever. Uh, 
if they brought exile back as a punishment, everyone would do crime right now. We would just be like, get me the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're thinking like deportation though, right? If they exiled yeah, you to Wyoming, you might not. Oh yeah, never mind. If a listener wants to tell me why Wyoming's cool, I'm welcome I'm sorry, to it. Wyoming. <laughs> we we hey man, we got schooled on Iowa and I appreciated yeah. it. So I'm welcome to a Wyoming schooling. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Send us your Wyoming facts. Alexander addressed the court. He gave a speech defending his use of terrorism. Damn. Saying, quote, terror is a road which particular individuals take spontaneously only when their discontent becomes extreme. Such people cannot be intimidated. Damn. I mean, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of at least an epic <laughs> way to address, but not very helpful for his uh, situation. All 15 defendants were condemned to death. Oof. Ten of them later get pardoned. Alexander is not one of those. And uh, he gets hanged. Shit. At 21 years old. Shit, that's young. How does Lennon take it? So he does not take it well. Uh, <laughs> he had kind of already been get dabbling in radical politics. He had already kind of picked this up. Probably some from his brother. Probably some from just being a young person at that time. Because like everybody was doing that, you know? <laughs> this is the thing to do. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> Think about like Dragon Age. Where some of your party members can get hardened, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of what happens here. Oh, okay, okay. He took the bad path. Yeah, Lennon's, you know, kind of like, okay, fine. You know, I know what I have to do now. Yeah. So, yeah. Then we go to his time at university. Because he had just graduated when all this happens. Oof. He's like, all right, I'm going to go to Kazan University to study law. Okay. 1887, he immediately joins up with a student regional society, which is just kind of like a, like a student organization, you know? Okay. But the problem was uh, that those had been banned <laughs> Whoops. Uh, by the government. And so he was, Damn. he went to this demonstration against that government ban. Mm -hmm. He gets arrested, he gets expelled, and then he gets exiled. Oh, man. Well, exiled, we should say, um, in quotes, because... Uh, it's to his family's country estate where he's exiled. <laughs> Damn, I want to get exiled if I get to go stay at a fancy mansion. <laughs> right? Uh, Fuck yeah. So there he's exiled. It's, you know, they always loved holidaying there as kids and everything. But now it's like so gloomy and stuff because Alexander has been Aww. like killed. Yeah, yeah. He starts reading all this radical literature. He just holds himself up in his room for most of the day and just reads, reads and Jeez. reads and reads. All this subversive literature. And the book that he was most obsessed with uh, was called What is to be Done? Okay. By Nikolai Chernievsky. Okay. I've heard of this book for some reason. I don't know why. Probably in my Wikipedia rabbit holes. Could be, yeah. Or um, Lennon ends up later writing a pamphlet titled this too, like after. Oh, uh, that's probably why. So it may be that too. He read this. This is a sign that, you know. <laughs> This would never happen in today's Netflix age or whatever. Someone in one summer <laughs> reading a book five times. Jeez. But that's what he did. <laughs> I mean, he had nothing else to do, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, so what's the big, why, why bring this book up? Yeah, what's about it? It's kind of a weird plot, but it's mainly about these young people who are revolutionaries. They're fighting for this utopian kind of commune that they see in their dreams. And the main theme is how unwavering and how ruthless these characters have to be. They have to subordinate their lives to the revolutionary goal and they do so. Okay. And I think that's kind of what Lenin draws from this book is what is required. Oof, that sounds heavy. To be a revolutionary. Yeah, that sounds intense. Yeah. Um, sounds like a bummer read. It, it does. <laughs> Not a beach read. One of the characters, like, he just like exercise uh, he doesn't exercise actually he just takes like manual labor jobs to build himself up and like eats raw meat and is <laughs> oh my like God. just this completely ascetic sort of individual uh but he's like a you know a hero because he's devoting his life fully to this idea Jeez, that's intense, man. Just becomes a straight up barbarian D&D &D character <laughs> for the cause. That's what's necessary, guys. Um, <laughs> actually, get your furs. Yeah, don't go eat raw meat. That's a that's very dangerous. <laughs> Please cook your food. Yeah. Unless it's, you know, one of those fancy things, steak tartare yeah, or something. Yeah, tartare. Yeah. yeah. Or sushi. Anyway, uh, I think this is a big deal for Lennon personality wise because he's a real zealot. 
like, and we'll see this over and over again. He is, he like breathes revolution all the time and he's incredibly self-disciplined. Mm -hmm. Like that's his shit. Yeah. Um, here's, here's a little anecdote that I got. Um, I'm going to cite a lot of times in throughout this, one of the main pieces I used for research is Lenin portrait of a professional revolutionary by Christopher Rice. Okay. Really well written, kind of a breeze to go through, especially once I had already read the Wikipedia outline flowed real well. So props nice. to him. But, uh, this anecdote, he go he talks about Lenin's mom getting worried about him being cooped up all day, reading, getting radicalized, right? Classic mom. <laughs> Lenny, you're spending all your time in your room. <laughs> I'm worried about you, Lenny. So she appeals to the government and says, hey, you know, can he go back to school? And they're like, no, dude, that guy was in a student group, but he can move back to the city if you want. That's fine. Can't go to university, but he can go to the city. They move back to Kazan and he's living with his mom. He's studying there on his own to try to eventually like take the exams for school anyway. And he takes up smoking during this time. Okay. And his mom tells him, Volodya, look, you don't pay the bills around here. You don't put food on the table. You don't do anything like that. So you shouldn't be indulging in a luxury like smoking. Ooh, okay. Kind of setting in that uh, self-discipline thing. Yeah, the dude never smokes again in his life. Oh my God. Lenny put that out right this instance. <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of admire that he could do that he could just change stick to it like not a problem yeah and that was you know that's crazy i think that's why that resonated so much with him in that book of like these are just the things you have to do if you're a revolutionary you know yeah yeah big self-discipline that's going to be a thing you'll see mm -hmm. over and over with this guy so anyway uh back in kazan he quickly does what he joins up with an illegal revolutionary discussion circle oh lenny i thought you learned your lesson <laughs> What? I'm sorry I'm playing this character of this Lennon's a, mom. This is a terrible character, but it's funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's So these discussion circles or whatever, I mean, it's kind of like an old school group chat, basically, but mm -hmm. in person. He's on the Discord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is where he first gets introduced to Marx. Oh, shit. I bet he loves that. Yeah. He reads Capital Volume 1. He gets hooked. <sighs> he had time for that, I guess. <laughs> I mean, he loved it, dude. He, he, he loves reading. It was his jam. Uh, he gets hooked. Winter of 1888. By 1889, his mom is worried. Lenny. Uh, she buys a country estate for them, like sells their old one, buys another one. Okay. When life gets you down, buy another country estate. That's what I always say. Why not? Uh and her plan is we're going to move there and little Vladimir is like, you know, young man Vladimir now is going to run it. Okay. It's going to become a proper gentleman. Yeah. Basically a planter, a manager of the serfs there. Oh God. And that's what he's going to do. This actually turns out to be a good idea in one sense in that the cops raid his discussion group shortly thereafter. So, uh, whew. oh, so he has somewhere to go. <laughs> yeah. So close call. Like he almost got rounded up, you know? <laughs> uh, but it's a bad idea in another sense because it just doesn't work. There's, n yeah. I can't find any sources as to why, but Lennon apparently hated it. I mean, I'm not shocked. Yeah. Having just read Marx, he probably doesn't like the idea of serfs anymore. It's like to him. Now I'm the bad guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that September they move uh, to a town called Samara. Okay. Lennon continues his law studies. And what do you think he does? Uh, Joins another fucking revolutionary group. This is what he does, yeah. <laughs> Plenty. Can't stay away from this stuff. Just can't stop. Uh, he becomes a full-on Marxist. Okay. He does the ritual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the moonlight <laughs> ritual. The secret ritual that we all We've know all about. We've all done that. Yes. He translates the Communist Manifesto into Russian. Nice. Uh, he keeps studying law. His mother petitions to let him do the exam thing, you know. And they say, yeah, sure. So in May 1891, he passes, flying colors, he becomes an authorized, you know, I guess like legal assistant, basically you have to do that first before mm -hmm. you can be a lawyer there. Okay. So he takes a job with a local lawyer being his assistant, spends a couple years doing that, but like, it's like lawyer by day, but mainly his, <laughs> his drive is to be in these discussion groups. Yeah. That just pays the bills, baby. Yeah. <laughs> I sympathize with that. 
Yeah, I feel that. <laughs> uh, so after a while, 1893 rolls around, he moves to St. Petersburg because his okay. his brother was like going off to college and his mom was like, I'm going to go live with him. So Lennon was like, great. Well, I'm going to go to the capital. I'm going to go do, do my own shit. Yeah. Okay. He's again, a lawyer's assistant, but at night he- Secret revolutionary. Secret revolutionary. Another illegal discussion group. This one, he kind of <laughs> comes to the leadership of, uh, and it's called the Social Democrats. That sounds very innocuous. It really does. <laughs> um, it's named after the German Social Democratic Party. I've read about them a little. Yeah, they were the cool kids of the socialist world at the time. <laughs> and so it was here in this discussion circle that he meets a consequential lady, mm. Nadiezhda. Oh, okay. Uh, Nadia is what she goes by for short, uh, Krupskaya. Okay. Eventually, she will become his wife. Okay, yeah. I'm like, I've, I've seen her name as a hyperlink on Wikipedia before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Nadia, she had had kind of a far harder upbringing than Lenin. Her father was a former army officer who was kind of like, I don't know, court-martialed or like fired in disgrace um, mm. for like not being an anti-Semite. Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. That's... Czarist that times were bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he died when she was 13. The family was in poverty. So she had to help her mom like run the house as a boarding house and also like tutor neighboring children. She had been Shit. a Marxist for like two years before meeting Lenin. Got in on it early. And I think th from the reading, it seems like she was crucial in Lenin's development as being a revolutionary leader. Because while he was like this big time Marxist nerd, mm -hmm. she actually knew real workers. Yeah, so she could connect him and shit. Yeah, like she had been running these workers' circles uh, with local workers there, reading with them, translating literature, answering questions, kind of like how we do, you know, with our readings and say, okay, what does this actually mean? She was doing that with mm, workers yeah. there, IRL. Okay, cool. Yeah, answering questions kind of about how their working conditions, you know, translated into Marxist theory. Yeah, yeah. It's like, here's why your wages are low. Yeah. And yeah, so that's cool. She had been doing this, and so by autumn of 1894, she gets Lenin into doing this. He was leading his own worker circles doing this and evading the cops, uh, using an alias, doing all these kind of secretive undercover stuff to avoid arrest. Damn, okay. You could get arrested for talking about theory? Oh, yeah, for, for trying to radicalize the workers and stuff. Yeah, that was spreading subversion, and you would just be, yeah, you'd be arrested for that. That sucks. Mm-hmm. So... He was real uh, meticulous about that, real careful about mm -hmm. covering his tracks, kind of paranoid, obsessive about that. But, yeah. uh, you know, the old saying is it's not paranoid if they're actually out to get you. And they were. That's a good point. So. Sounds like they were. <laughs> uh, in May 1895, Lennon traveled to Switzerland, his first trip abroad. Okay. How'd that go? Well, this was uh, a mission to meet with a group called Emancipation of Labor. That's a good name. It's kind of cool, yeah. Uh, it was founded by the father of Russian Marxism, Georgi Plekhanov. Okay. And he was living kind of in a self-imposed exile. Uh, Lenin meets with him and other members of the group and kind of does some Marxist networking here. <laughs> you know, makes a good impression. <laughs> and it's just like, I have a group, you know, we should be friends. We should do stuff. We yeah. should do some revolution, you know. <laughs> so he goes to Marxist con. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and from there, he kind of travels. He goes to Paris to research the Paris Commune. Oh, yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. It's kind of, I think it will be a future episode topic at some point. For sure. He also meets with Paul Lafargue, mm -hmm. who's Marx's son in law. Marx at this point was already dead. Uh, but yeah, he meets with this guy. The reason I include this is because he was the author of an essay that I know that you would love. What's it called? It's called The Right to Be Lazy. Oh, give me that shit. Shoot it into my veins. <laughs> I haven't read it for sure, but basically it's like, uh, people shouldn't have to work. You know, people should be able Fuck to just be. Yeah. Yeah. Send me that link. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he travels around some more. He meets with various uh, European socialists and stuff and apparently stocks up on illicit revolutionary publications. Neat. Because he <laughs> smuggles those back into Russia when he returns. He gets his swag bag. Yeah. <laughs> In 1895, 
he successfully smuggles his stuff in back in Russia. He and his social Democrat friends, they begin spreading literature around. They begin trying to radicalize the workers. They start preparing their own newspaper, The Workers' Cause. Okay. Uh, they had just finished getting it ready. Everything was going well. And Cops. they were all arrested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They always show up when things are going well. Yeah, more than 40 of them all swept up by the cops on December 8th, Lenin included. Damn. Yep. Bummer. Uh, he denies everything. The classic, you know, good move. Mm -hmm. I don't think they had, like, the right to a lawyer or anything there. Otherwise, I'm sure he would be smart enough to just not talk till a lawyer mm -hmm. comes. Because he's, you know, he's got it. Yeah. He remains jailed before his trial for 15 months before they get around Shit. to him. Shit. That's a long time. Yeah, that can happen. <laughs> During this time, what does he do? He reads a ton of literature, uh, yeah. which people are just bringing to him. They they apparently didn't like scan it too closely or anything. <laughs> uh, he writes about socialism. He has people smuggle him in secret messages about revolutionary activities, which he kind of coordinates with them. Damn, okay. He's like writing secret messages, which you could apparently do with milk. What? You could use milk and like write between the lines of a book to give like a message to somebody. I'm probably going to try that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna practice my milk writing. Yeah. Uh, good tactics for budding revolutionaries. <laughs> so in February 1897, he's finally sentenced without a trial to a three year exile in Eastern Siberia. Shit. That's not a good place. I mean, climate wise. Yeah, well, he ends up kind of getting an okay gig. Uh, he It's it's just like not a terrible village, really. Okay, okay. The way he writes about it anyway. He spent a few days getting his affairs in order is what they okay. let him do, which what does he spend it doing? <laughs> he goes to talk to his socialist friends. <laughs> he, the, the rest of the social democrat group had epically renamed themselves. Oh, give it. Give me the new name. Now they're called the League of Struggle for the Emancipation of the Working Class. That's a real glow up of a name. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. Should be engraved on like a shield or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So he meets with them and takes like a dramatic picture with them and just kind of tells them what's going to happen and hopefully set up, you know, how they're going to talk. And he elects to, this is like an old thing from Tsarist times, I guess, but he elects to uh, travel on his own there, which takes him like okay. 11 months. And his mother and some a sibling accompany him and they all go up to. That's crazy. That's where he is. But yeah, you, could, you used to could do that. You I could guess. just be like, I'll totally show up. Yeah. I guess it was because as long as they watched to make sure you went out in the right direction, then you better go or, <laughs> or you die. <laughs> So his family accompanies him. He's exiled to a peasant's hut because big mistake here. The government really didn't deem him to be much of a threat. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not a good judgment call. Yeah. Yeah. From their perspective. I'm glad they made the <laughs> mistake though. Uh, his exile. I mean, it was exile, but it was kind of nice. Uh, he was under police surveillance, but mm -hmm. he could still correspond with fellow revolutionaries. What are these police doing? He could have visitors. He could go hunting and hiking and all that. Like Pretty chill. He made friends with people in the village and like had just a kind of normal life, basically. Yeah. During this time, Nadia got arrested and exiled, uh, and she convinces them to transfer her to the same village, to oh. Shushinskoye, she, by claiming that they were engaged. That's how you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it's love, people. Get exiled to the same village. <laughs> Yeah. So she convinces them of that and they're like, fine, but you got to get married, you know? And she's like, so okay. And so yeah, they go and they get married when they get there, July 22nd, 1898. That's a power proposal move, by the way. <laughs> That's how I should have done it. <laughs> you show up. Uh, I got ex I had to get here. I had to convince them that we were engaged. So now we need to get married. Yep. Okay. That's it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, he keeps working on socialist literature, publishes his own books during his exile. Nothing too crazy. Just a detective series. <laughs> no, like communist <laughs> literature. Yeah. I know, I'm just kidding. Just, you made it sound so yeah, mild. It was just... <laughs> a YA fiction. A little detective series set in a uh, rural village. Yeah. Dealing with exiles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's done with exile in 1900. 
he ends up spending some time abroad with other Marxists. He makes some friends. He loses some friends. It's not super important, important overall. It's kind of like petty. Just Twitter bickering shit. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He gets into <laughs> some Twitter flame wars with various okay. leftists. He also starts an underground newspaper. Nice. Called Iskra, which means spark. Oh, I like that name. It's kind of good. It becomes Russia's biggest illegal newspaper. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Nadia ends up coming to join him after, you know, serving out her last year of exile. Uh, and they live together in Munich. They keep doing kind of political work there, you know, publishing stuff, trying to smuggle it into Russia, that sort of thing. Uh, in 1902, he publishes his own pamphlet called What is to be Done. Mm, okay, his fanfic. Yes, named after his favorite novel of all time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a novel. It's just, it's kind of like an essay. Mm, okay, okay. And in it, it's kind of an interesting defense of the concept of a vanguard party. Mm, yeah, we've talked about this before. It's like a small group. Right. A small group of full-time, dedicated, you know, professional revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. and, and he's saying, you know, this is important. And he's got two reasons. One, he's talking about Russia here. And he says, one, Russia is a police state. The czar, you know. Rules as an autocrat, you don't have any rights, you, you know, so, so you need a disciplined, closely knit party to avoid getting broken up by the police. That makes sense. Right? You can't publicly say, oh, I'm with the, you know, the communists. Like, <laughs> I would love to overthrow this government, please. <laughs> yeah. They won't let you do that, you know? No. So he says, one, secrecy, right? Two, mm -hmm. he says, the working class needs a vanguard party. Because on its own, it can't move beyond just uh, economic, what he calls trade union consciousness, mm -hmm. only thinking about economic struggles. Marx kind of said that through economic struggles, the proletariat would gradually gain a, a class consciousness because yeah. it would see that playing out and it would realize, oh, we're a class, we got to do things. And Lenin said, mm -hmm. they're not going to make that last jump and tie it to political solutions. They're only going to want like better wages, better working conditions, but they're not going to realize that they need to change the political system overall to get that done. Like the whole structure? Yeah. He said that they would need professional, you know, intellectuals to guide them to that conclusion. Okay. I don't know if I agree with that. I feel like, I mean, it, it depends. If they're continuing these like worker circles or whatever, where they're like radicalizing them, then yeah, I think I think maybe normal or like average workers, whatever that means, would automatically be like, yeah, better wages. But once I think they would understand the structure, wouldn't they be like, yeah, fuck capitalism? Like, I kind of think so too. Like, I'm with I'm with you on that. I will say that as kind of a, an addition in this, he does emphasize that the party should want to bring in and include and kind of like raise up to leadership status workers like ASAP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he kind of starts from this position of they're incapable of doing that on their own. Maybe to the context of the time, like you don't have the internet, like you're just having these fucking like one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and like Russia's so fucking big, like okay, yeah. that's probably really hard. Maybe so know? saying, yeah, it just won't work or at least not in our yeah, lifetimes. Yeah, like people aren't like <laughs> literate yet. Like there's a lot of bumps to get through. Yeah, I guess that makes sense too. But yeah, I, I kind of had that apprehension too of like- I don't know. You're kind of saying they're dumb, you know? Yeah, it's a little condescending. But that's what what is to be done is about. As 1902. Uh, from there, he moves to London. I like this because he wrote in his diary, the first impression of London. Hideous. <laughs> Zero stars. <laughs> yeah. Day one. I love it. Sucks. Uh, <laughs> Do not come here. Another great. big deal there is that he meets with some other Russian exiled revolutionaries, uh, including okay. Leon Trotsky. Oh, that guy. Yeah. Uh, he had recently escaped exile in Siberia. <laughs> cool. Uh, in July 1903, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party had its second Congress. Okay. This is a different party than that other one that changed his name. Yeah, I was going to say, so like, if you're wondering where this came from, right? What is that? Yeah. Uh, this is a combo formed in 1898 while Lenin was in exile. A combination of the League, you know, the League of Heroes, the League of Struggle for the Emancipation <laughs> of the Working Class, his peeps, with the General Jewish Labor Bund, mm -hmm. which was kind of a union of Jewish social democrats. Okay. 
uh, and a social democratic group centered on the workers' newspaper. Not super important. Just a bunch of different groups. Okay. Combined. Okay, coalition. Yeah. And this is what uh, the party here on out is going to refer to, is the Russian okay. Social Democratic Labor Party. Yeah, yeah. That's what it. That's what they're talking about now. They were founded, like we said, in 1898. It was kind of inglorious. Ex Lenin was exiled at the time. He smuggled to them a party program written in milk. <laughs> it was an illegal meeting. Most of the delegates were arrested shortly thereafter. Shit. But they had founded the party and they had agreed to meet in London, which is where we find ourselves at this point. Nice. <laughs> so the big deal here, the reason we bring up the second Congress of the party is there is a major split that happens here. You guys got to get it together. Come on. Well, they don't actually split up parties, but they split into two factions within the party still. Oh, okay, okay. Which is in some ways almost worse, maybe. I don't know. Because uh, they do a lot of fighting. Um, they're called the <laughs> Bolsheviks uh -huh, uh -huh. and the Mensheviks. Okay, I don't know those. Yeah. So they have a big argument, right? They have a big split. And the dispute is pretty simple. Who can be an official party member? Mm -hmm. Lenin said it should only be like active participants in party organization, right? He wants to keep it small. Yeah. And his opponent, Julius Martov, the leader of the Mensheviks, said, let's open up the tent. It should also include people who just like kind of regularly work with us, mm. but aren't in the organization. Okay. So they don't have leadership or anything, but they, you know, are doing stuff. Yeah. Okay. They should be party members too. So opening it up to more people, that's the Mensheviks. Bolsheviks were, no, 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 keep it closed. Mm -hmm. So they had a vote and Lenin lost. Ooh. 28 23. Tough. Okay. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, later on, a bunch of the delegates walked out. They got pissed about something. And uh, <laughs> oh that tilted the vote in Lenin's favor. So he calls the vote again and he wins. Oh my God. What a petty bitch. <laughs> and so <laughs> since he's in the majority for that vote, his faction gets called the Majoritarians or the Bolsheviks. Okay. And Martov's faction becomes called the Mensheviks or, you know, the minority. Mm, okay. Okay. Even though he had lost the vote beforehand. So I, I love that he <laughs> That's good. twists it on them. <laughs> and pretty much at the, at the meeting, since the walkout happens, he kind of gets his way for the rest of it. It goes his way. He's feeling good after that. So after that Congress, and they have this big split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, they're still in the same party, but they really descend into a lot of annoying, petty, bickering, <sighs> calling names, all kinds of things basically fall apart here. They become separate factions. It's not good. The usual. Yeah. Lenin <laughs> gets pissed and he quits the newspaper and his Bolshevik faction founds their own newspaper called Vipered, which means forward. Okay. And it's just looking like, it's looking a little bleak. Mm -hmm. When revolution happens, 1905, things were still shitty in Tsarist Russia, and they had strikes going on, and on January 22nd, um, they had a an orthodox priest slash police informant named <laughs> Georgi Gepon mm -hmm. lead these demonstrations, all these workers going out to the Winter Palace to deliver a petition requesting, you know, reforms. Mm -hmm. Well, wait, he was a police informant too? Yeah, it's weird. Um, <laughs> it's weird. It's a weird job for you to do then. He's strange. Yeah, he's, I don't yeah. know. They get gunned down. Uh, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 people are killed by the army. Shit. Becomes known as Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've heard of that. And uh, I think there are several different ones because people can't quit killing each other. But <laughs> Okay, just bloody every day of the week at that point. Maybe, yeah. Uh, so day. this was the beginning of the revolution of 1905. Okay. We briefly covered this in the Russian Civil War episode, uh, mm -hmm. calling it the dress rehearsal for the revolution. Yeah, yeah. That sounds familiar. And so uh, strikes and protests broke out nationwide, as did assassinations. Uh, and peasants started raiding landowners' estates. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, okay, well... What's Lenin got to do with this? He's abroad. He hears about it in Geneva. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, you know, he gets excited. He's like, whoa, shit, this is actually Fuck going yeah, down. yeah, it's time. Yeah. He writes a pamphlet called Two Tactics of Social Democracy in the Democratic Revolution. Okay. Not a great name. <laughs> it's not. It doesn't feel like appropriate. Like, let's talk about democracy now that we're fucking in the middle of fighting. Well, so it ends up being kind of consequential. It's a reevaluation of what's going on in Russia. 
He mm-hmm. kind of says, okay, I know I said before that the peasants are kind of bullshit. They're kind of backward. <laughs> I'm thinking now the peasants are cool because they're fighting people. Yes. So he reevaluates them and says, they're actually kind of a revolutionary force. And we should ally. We should have an alliance with the proletarians and the peasants. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And he also predicts that the bourgeoisie is not going to be any use. They might do their mm-hmm. bourgeois revolution or whatever, but they're going to be fine with just like some reforms. They're going to be fine with a constitutional monarchy. Yep. And he can't trust them. Yeah. Yeah. I think mean, that's fair. Which 100% happens. Uh, <laughs> in October, <laughs> Tsar Nicholas II proposes some liberal reforms. You know, he's like, okay, what about uh, free speech, freedom of assembly? <laughs> uh, we give you a, a little a little Congress, you know? Cute. Yeah. <laughs> And everyone, but like the socialists were happy with that. Everyone was like, that's fine. Yeah. That's good. And they give up the revolution. Le- Lenin moves back. He's trying to work with the socialists, trying to do some insurrection and stuff. And they start like making bombs and gathering weapons and stuff, but it fails. Like there's not enough people behind the movement anymore mm. after the reform. It just fizzles out. Yeah. Okay. Sounds familiar. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, it's during all this flurry of activity that he meets Joseph Stalin. That guy. Is this where he starts robbing trains? Uh, yeah. <laughs> he meets him at a party conference. <laughs> mm-hmm. Stalin actually claims that he was kind of unimpressed by Lenin. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, whatever. He said he was smaller than he expected. He does look big. Lenin does? He looks like he'd be tall. He's short. Oh, short man. Yeah. Short king. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they do end up teaming up for some cool robberies. Cool. This is like the second movie when you get a team together, you know, and there's a cool heist. Yeah. They start, um, I mean, robbing carriages and, and robbing like bank trains, basically. Cool. They call them expropriations. And this is how the Bolsheviks were like funding a lot of what they did was Damn. knocking off these things. There is one that they, you know, they don't have the exact estimates on it, but they estimate they stole around 3.4 million US dollars worth. Jesus. 300 something th- thousand rubles. But yeah, the yeah. problem was a lot of them were in large denomination notes that they actually had the serial numbers of, so they couldn't like oh, spend them right. Yeah. Yeah. Stalin was a uh, bank robbing for him basically. <laughs> and anyway, at that meeting, they agree that they're going to hold another conference. And they also agree that they're not going to take part in this stupid, uh, this stupid assembly that the czar has created, the Duma. Mm-hmm. They're like, that's okay. dumb. The czar made it. It sucks. Yeah. And, and is it? I'm trying to remember. I should have listened to that episode before. But if you want to go back and listen, it is episode four. So find that in the archives if you want to review Russian Revolution. Yeah. But what I was going to say is, isn't that the Duma or whatever? Isn't that like... It's their baby Congress, but it's only made up of like rich people. Is that right? Yeah, it's a baby Congress. It starts out kind of okay, but the government just keeps like dissolving it until they change it to where it's only made up of rich people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) Shitty Congress. All shitty. Yeah. They agree. We're not going to be a part of that. That sucks. Mm -hmm. The next few years are kind of mm, uninteresting. They're kind of a travel slash study slash argument montage. Yeah. More of the same. Yeah. Read books, argue with people, whatever. A couple highlights for you out of that. Uh, There's a guy named Roman Malinovsky that joins the party. Okay. And he comes in and he is 100% backing Lenin on everything. Okay. He's his best bro. All right. That's because he was well paid to do so by the Tsar's secret police. (gasps) Oh, no. Fake friends. He was paid more, in fact, than the director of the Imperial Police. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. He was there to stir up shit, to keep the party divided, and to be a spy. And Damn, that sucks. The secret police thought, this Lenin guy, he's fighting everybody. We should just back him and you know drive people mm-hmm. away. He doesn't get discovered as, a, as an informant until 1914. Oh my gosh. And even then, Lenin's kind of like reluctant to disavow him because he's <gasps> like, this dude's been like sticking by me for so, you know? Oh, that's so tragic. Yeah. He meets with French Bolshevik Inessa Armand. Okay. A fellow revolutionary, later Soviet official. She's a real big women's rights activist in the early Soviet Union. Okay. Cool. Close friend, possible lover, depending on the biographer that you read. Mm, okay. Okay. I don't really have a conclusion on it. it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another, just kind of comic aside, he sues a driver in Paris for hitting him on his bike. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he wins the lawsuit too. He puts that law degree to use finally. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's the travel montage. It gets us to 1914 when World War One breaks out. 
Oh, damn. Lenin was abroad. He was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. That seems like a bad place to be when that shit goes down. It was. He uh, <laughs> he got arrested um, immediately because he was, you know, an enemy alien. Mm. And so, they, but they like quickly release him because A, they had no evidence of him doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and B, he was an enemy of their enemy. Once they found out like, oh, this guy hates the czar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, never mind. He's cool. <laughs> yeah. They were like, oh, it's fine. <laughs> uh, he gets released. But. Pretty soon thereafter, he's just like super pissed, mm -hmm. angry, because he finds out that the German Social Democratic Party, the dudes that he named his original socialist group after. Oh, his idols. His idols. They had betrayed him. They had betrayed all socialists, workers around the world by supporting the German war effort. Shit. Don't have heroes, y'all. They had like literally, at the Second International, they had agreed that socialist parties would oppose any bourgeois conflicts, and here they are saying, oh, yeah, actually, uh, this is good. <laughs> that sucks, man. Classic downfall for socialist groups, as we've seen on the pod before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was total bullshit. And Lenin uh, goes around, you know, urging socialists, no, no, don't do that, you know, resist. Try to convert this imperialist war into a class war, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, he's still abroad. He can't get back to Russia at this time. Uh, and in July 1916, his mother dies. Oh. Yeah. He couldn't attend the funeral. I mean, he was really depressed about it. She had really spoiled him, you know, looked after him. <laughs> she sent him money when he was traveling abroad and not working. She bought an estate to cheer him up. So, like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was, like, always by his side, even though she really didn't like, you know, she was kind of scared of mm. his politics and everything. She was still always there. When he was imprisoned, they allowed, like, food deliveries three times mm -hmm. a week and she would cook him a special diet to ease his like stomach problems. Oh, here you go, Lenny. Yeah. But <laughs> oh. that character's done. She died. Oh, you're so relieved though. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, thank God I don't want to hear this terrible Carmela ass voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that happened to Lenin. Poor guy. Bummer. In 1917, he publishes uh, one of his more important works called Imperialism, the Highest Stage mm. of Capitalism. Yeah, uh, I've read a few quotes from that, and it's good. It is, yeah. Um, I was reading about it, and kind of the summary is that he argues that capitalism, the way it develops, it becomes more and more, you know, monopolized. Mm -hmm. Eventually, banks merge into monopolies, and capitalism starts moving past focusing on manufacturing commodities yeah. and moves into finance capitalism, into just making money by moving money around, speculating, you know? Yeah, yeah. Wall Street. <laughs> Fake money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this leads to countries basically, you know, doing imperialism, uh, exporting and investing capital in underdeveloped countries mm -hmm. by exploiting, you know, their people, their natural resources, set up plantations, mines, all that. Yep. And uh, businesses and governments, you know, closely intertwined, eventually end up carving up the world and they start fighting over the right to exploit different parts of it. Yeah, absolutely. We just finished up reading Open Veins for a future app, and uh, that's basically the headline for that book, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I thought that was a great tie in. Uh, Lenin said that these wars could only be ended by proletarian revolution. And it's, you know, it's just a good way to like see, explain the kind of the mechanisms of exploitation in terms of imperialism and also like how wars start. For sure. For sure. Makes sense. Yeah. So that was 1917. That ends up being published in September 1917. He's kind of like working on it beforehand, though. So that's why I bring it up here. Oh, okay. Okay. Because a lot of stuff starts happening. In March 1917, the February Revolution breaks out <laughs> in Russia. Okay. This is another one for the to go back to look, episode four to yes. hear about. Uh, basically, it's a calendar dispute. <laughs> <laughs> the reason the revolution breaks out is because things were still shitty. Mm-hmm. Shocker. Especially the Great War. <laughs> I mean, the Great War was terrible. But like pretty much only liberals are surprised that the earlier reforms didn't work out. Yeah, yeah. Workers in Petrograd, uh, this is formerly St. Petersburg, they go out on strike. Uh, a women's strike on International Women's Day turns into a protest for bread. Fuck yeah. And the czar gets told, dude, uh, you need to quit. It's over. Or <laughs> the country's going down in flames. Turn in your fluffy crown thing. Yeah. And so he does. He quits. And the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet take power. Nice. Yeah, so the provisional government's just kind of like a like a temporary, you know, a temporary group of people running the country. 
uh, and the Petrograd Soviet was a like these workers' councils uh, in Petrograd okay. had all banded together and were kind of making local decisions there. Cool. So where was Lenin during this? Lenin uh, was still abroad. What the fuck? I thought he did this. He didn't do shit. Yeah, he was still stuck over in, I think he was still in Switzerland at the time. Okay. And this, you know, yeah, this starts happening. <laughs> the provisional government and Petrograd Soviet take over. They s decide to stay in World War One. Oh, man. Uh, and so Lenin's like, fuck this. I need to get back to Russia uh, so I can take part in all this stuff that's happening. Yeah, yeah. And so he gets the German government to agree to let him and 31 other Russian exiles to let them travel through their territory. I bet they regretted that later. Way later, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way later, yeah. Uh, and they let him travel through in a sealed train up through Sweden and eventually to Finland, which was still part of Russia at the time. Okay. He agreed in exchange to talk to the government to try to get them to release some German mm. prisoners there who had been detained. Okay. Uh, and also, it was just implied like, hey, you hate that government. Like, why don't you go mess with them? <laughs> yeah. Could you go get rid of that, please? Yeah. <laughs> That was a good estimation. They yeah. short term that worked. <laughs> <laughs> Long term, not so much, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so Lenin arrives uh, back in Russia, makes his way to Petrograd. He's greeted there as a hero. People are just super excited to see him come and stir and shit up. Okay. And he addresses a Bolshevik meeting there, and he outlines his plan called the April Theses. Okay. Where he says, "Provisional government, big middle finger to you." <laughs> this one was bad. Yeah. He says, provisional government, no way. He says, all power to the Soviets, those local councils. Mm, yeah, yeah. He says, let's end the war. He says, peace, land, bread. He says, let's nationalize the land. Let's nationalize the banks. Let's abolish the police. Let's abolish the army. Let's abolish the bureaucracy. There's a Twitter account called Cat Jamming to Tunes or something <laughs> like that. And it's just that one cat video of that. Yeah. And they put different anime openings behind his head. And that's basically the motion I'm making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he opens with. Everybody's pretty shocked. <laughs> Sounds great. It was, well, it was unique because, and it's a big deal, because the Bolsheviks were the only group doing this. They were the only group not cooperating in some way with the provisional government. The Mensheviks, their rivals, and uh, this other party called the Socialist Revolutionary Party, they're kind of like more agrarian mm. focused. They both were cooperating in varying degrees with the with the coalition government. Mm, they were all like, oh, maybe we can just fix it. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviks were like, fuck that. <laughs> Let's do it. So that's a big deal because the provisional government, you know, continues in the war and that sucks. That goes terribly. Mm -hmm. um, and they just continue to fuck up in general. So people get pissed at them and anyone associated with them. And so the Bolsheviks are like the only game in town who is credible, you know, who like, yeah, 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 we didn't team up with them. Yeah. Who's selling what they want. Yeah. So, uh, Lenin goes there. He ends up like going to Finland for like health reasons. He gets sick and has to like retire out to Finland for a while mm -hmm. when the July days happen. Okay. What happens then again? The July days was kind of an uprising. It's almost an abortive attempt at a revolution. Mm, okay. The, there's like a big arm demonstration. Then the cops come out and try to crush it. There's like a almost revolution feel. Okay. Lenin quickly returns to Petrograd to get involved only to have to sneak out shortly thereafter when the government starts cracking down because the whole thing failed. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Okay. And here is where the government makes an allegation that Mr. Lenin was a German agent provocateur. Ooh, okay. I mean, they're not not wrong, you know? <laughs> they're <laughs> I don't know how to say that right. I mean, they have a, you know, I guess that it, there's some merit, right, in that he was yeah. brought in by Germany, I guess. There's some of that flavor in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think in the full sense of the word in terms of like, I'm doing this so that Germany succeeds. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. You know, that's definitely not true. Yeah. But, you know, that was an allegation by them, kind of, probably out of desperation, that some people have seized upon afterward to try to be like, Lenin, he sucks. He was just a German agent. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Uh, so it's also this year that he writes his famous work, The State and Revolution. Okay. And this is a big work of theory. Mm-hmm. And in it, he expounds on the theory of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I've heard this term. We talked about it, I think, last episode, actually. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and this is kind of where I was 
sort of drawing some of that interpretation from because the basic summary kind of really closely hews to what Engels was talking about. Uh, the basic mm -hmm. summary is that the proletarian revolution, right? It has to smash the old bourgeois state. Yep. It has to replace it with a new state, a worker's state. And explicitly he was kind of modeling this after the Paris commune, Okay, which means that, you know, it's police force would be just like an armed people's militia. Okay. Elected officials would rotate out and be like immediately recallable. They would only get the wages of a worker. The state would be there as this tool to expropriate the expropriators, as he put it. Um, go after the bourgeoisie, right? Okay, so this is like what Engel said, like the state exists to dismantle the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The state is now your tool to get rid of your class enemies, make sure they don't rise up against you sort of thing. Okay, that I guess that was going to be my next question is maybe this is just semantics, but like, why is it a dictatorship necessarily? Because I feel like in most people's definitions of dictatorship, that implies like one guy's in charge. Um, I, it may be partially semantics. He's trying to, uh, to relate that to what he says the current form of government is, no matter how liberal it is. It is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. Mm, okay. Okay. So he's saying that this government is going to be ru run by one class and that class is going to be the proletariat. Okay. So if you wanted to translate it for people who are scared of that term, because I think we've actually gotten a listener question on this. Like, why is it called that? Like a dictatorship sounds bad. Right. So maybe you could translate it to just mean a worker run state, if that feels better to you. <laughs> yeah. The worker state, you could call it that. That's true. Mm -hmm. We'll see that Lenin kind of leans on the dictatorship part of it um, as time goes on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah. But yeah, that's true that if you're just following the theory, theory, you don't have to. You can put as much liberal kind of parliamentary democracy in it as you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and this is where he analyzes and says, okay, you know, and then once you've gotten rid of the opposition, the class antagonisms in society, and you moved on past that, then the special repressive force of the state would wither away. Nice. Um, I also found a really good quote in here that he was talking about what people, how people interpret Marx and try to like make him sound nice and centrist and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but this can apply to lots of different people in our historical record. Here it is. During the lifetime of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes constantly hounded them, receiving their theories with the most savage malice, the most furious hatred and the most unscrupulous campaigns of lies and slander. After their deaths, attempts are made to convert them into harmless icons, to canonize them, so to say, and to hallow their names to a certain extent for the colonization of the oppressed classes, and with the object of duping the latter, while at the same time robbing the revolutionary theory of its substance, blunting its revolutionary edge, and vulgarizing it. Oh, that's good. That's very good. What does that bring to mind? Martin Luther King, for uh, one? I was going to say Martin Luther King. For, that was my very first yeah, answer. <laughs> that's that's a big one for sure, because people don't know that you know he died campaigning for poor people's rights. He was an anti-Vietnam War activist. He was pretty much a socialist mm -hmm. by that time, you know? But yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of figures, I guess, get that treatment. I thought it was interesting that Lenin pointed that out. Yeah. I mean, there's been kind of some discourse going on about how frustrating it was to see like Joe Biden's campaign and now proto presidency co opt these messages, uh, like these leftist messages, but not actually enforce them. So it just waters it all down. Yeah. Basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. It sucks. Yep. Here's something that happens in September. The Bolsheviks gained a majority in the Moscow and the Petrograd Soviets. So this was because the okay. other parties had cooperated with the government. They were less popular now. So people were like, let's go mm. with the Bolsheviks. Okay, cool, cool. Trotsky gets elected leader of the Petrograd Soviet. Lenin's like, okay, that's dope. I'm coming back. <laughs> After his retreat in the July days fiasco. Finland? Yeah, to, yeah okay. to Finland. He comes back on October 10th. He convinces the Bolshevik like central committee, like the party planning committee sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like the planning committee for the party, not a party planning committee. That would be... <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I really think we should go crouche this time. I know no one ate it last time, but there was too much cauliflower. <laughs> uh, and he convinces them that now is the time to lead an armed insurrection against the government. Neat. Yeah, they do so. It's called the October Revolution. Heard of that one. They finalize their plans and they start this, of course, on November instead of October. 
November 7th, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they, they kind of have, you know, a militia, the, the Red Guard, move in to take key points in Petrograd, besiege the Winter Palace, capture most of its leadership. And then, I mean, they announce to the Petrograd Soviet, look what we did. <laughs> <laughs> So remind me, this is the provisional government yes. which had been working with with the Soviet groups or whatever. Correct. Yeah, that was a situation called dual power. Yes, I've heard of that term. Where the Soviet groups were like you know, more or less command in command in the streets, had the the mandate from the workers, and the provisional government had more official like higher level control, and were the bourgeois like bureaucracy. Yeah, the bu- bureaucracy and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Got it. So they did it. Yeah, they come, they they say, look what we did. The Mensheviks are pissed. They're like, what? How could you? <laughs> sure. We were in that government. Why did you do that? You know, um, <laughs> they they get pissed and they leave. And as they leave, this is when Trotsky, he's like, lets them have it out the, on their way out the door. He stands up and he's raging and he says, they'll- <laughs> Rips them a new one. They'll go to the dustbin of history. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Even though he actually had been a former Menshevik back in the day. Reformed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the Russian Republic eventually becomes renamed the Russian Soviet Republic. And then it's eventually re renamed the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic. Wow. Okay. Had some first drafts. Yeah. <laughs> it gets renamed later too, <laughs> but that's fine. It's okay. The new government of the country, like the governing body, was called the Council of People's Commissars. Sounds great. Uh, which, yeah, kind of have a, has an edge to it. Mm-hmm. It's called Sovnarkom for short. Uh, anyway, Lenin is elected as its chairman, Okay, which basically puts him in charge of the country. Yeah. Not 100%. And we'll we'll talk about that as, as it comes up. So this is kind of like in the movie we watched, The Death of Stalin. Is this like you have all those different ministers of different things? Yes. He's the prime, you know, he's the premier. He's in charge. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you have all these other guys and they do vote on stuff. Okay, gotcha. Um, and you will see here in the early part that that actually, you know, doesn't always go his way. Mm, okay. So I find this interesting because I think one of my, like I wrote questions to send to you and one of mine was like, how did he get in there? You know, how did he rise to power? I thought he was like fucking fighting and stuff or like at least leading that, but he kind of just came in after and was like, hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, he was, he was a little older than most of them to be fighting, I guess. Uh, cause yeah, I guess that's true. He's 47 by that time. Mm-hmm. But he he was, you know, he was the leader of the party, that the Bolshevik faction, mm-hmm. which by that point was in charge of the party. By virtue of being, you know, of having led this party for so long, everyone kind of knew where he stood and the, you know, events and people had shifted around to that point of view. Yeah. That's kind of how he got in. You know, what when his party took over, then he did. But yeah, he wasn't, you're right. He wasn't, you know, on the front lines. He wasn't part of like, (laughs) yeah, he wasn't part of the October revolution, I guess. Or wait, that one or the other one? He wasn't a part of the February revolution. That's the one. (laughs) He is a crucial part of the October revolution, organizing it and everything, but he's not like in the red guards there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a rifle or something. Yeah. Okay. So he's taken power, right? He's in charge. And the very next day, that's November 7th that they take command, November 8th. Mm -hmm. Open for business. Let's start doing some shit. All right. New country. Who this? So we're going to cover this kind of by theme. Okay. And sort of by year, but there's going to be some, a little bit of overlap, like just the way it works out. So they start issuing decrees. Cool. And Lenin starts issuing these. There's the first one is the decree on peace. Ends that war? Yeah. Well, it calls for an immediate withdrawal of Russia from World War I. They kind of put the call out there, right? And- Germany's mm-hmm. like, yeah, sure, let's do it. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> so they sign an armistice to like a three-month ceasefire mm-hmm. so that they can negotiate what the actual peace is going to be. Okay. But it starts the process. That's good. Uh, the decree on land, mm-hmm. which declares that all aristocratic and church lands would be nationalized and redistributed mm. to the peasants by local governments. Delicious. Yeah, I like that one. That one's, that one's cool. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of... A lot of other decrees. <laughs> uh, some highlights, some of them good, some of them, a few of them not so good. Uh, okay. So most of them good, though. Eight-hour workday. Like that one? Social insurance, like Social Security sort of thing. You know, oh, okay, but okay. actually sufficient. <laughs> um, <laughs> and like actually free? Yeah. Minimum wage. Good. Factories run by elected workers committees. Sounds great. Setting up free public education. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mass electrification of the countryside. Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, setting up orphanages, removing divorce restrictions, uh, separating church and state, abolishing noble ranks, nationalizing the banks. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Cool shit. Yeah. What was the not cool shit? The not cool shit involves quashing freedoms of the press. Oh, man. Can't do that. Okay. He ran a fucking illegal newspaper. Just want to point that out. He ran two of them. Well, he wants to keep future illegal newspapers in business, you know? They have to... <laughs> they can't be illegal if they're... No, but I mean, and I guess his true. argument would be, and we'll get to this in a little bit, that we're, uh, we've are we been plunged into civil war because not everyone's agreeing with us and people are openly trying to rebel against the government. And so we've got to fight that by mm. shutting down the newspapers. Mm, okay. It's heavy-handed. <laughs> you think? It would not be a step I would want to take unless I really had to. And obviously I would be pretty questioning of anybody who's saying that you had to, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's pretty crazy. Let's not. I could be present. I feel like I could be presented with a situation where I would be like, okay, but I don't know. I can't I mean, think of it off the top of my head. <laughs> if all your, all your journalists for some reason turn into Fox news, then like, yeah, we should get rid of those. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, it was targeted only at like, hey, if you publish whatever, but you know, who decides that? So it mm -hmm. puts a lot of power to you, to the government to kind of censor people. Damn. So that's Bummer. the bad side. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of good, you know, a lot of other good stuff in there. So there's that. Yeah. This is where we see all those like big changes, like from what I recall from earlier episodes, like the eradicating like anti-sodomy laws and stuff like that. And... Mm -hmm. Wasn't there some like abortion rights in there too? Yeah. Well, by yeah. abolishing the old code, they had basically lifted that immediately. Yeah. So. so basically getting rid of all the czar shit that was bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? So that's kind of like just changing the laws mm -hmm. on day one. Day one. We mentioned the decree on peace. Mm -hmm. uh, they signed the armistice. Super important because, you know, I mean, the Bolsheviks had really can credit a lot of their rise to being firmly anti-war the whole time. Mm -hmm. Once they signed the armistice, they began peace talks at Brest-Litovsk in Belarus uh, okay. with the Germans, you know? Mm -hmm. And so Lenin wanted to agree to the German terms immediately, which was like, give up Poland, give up Lithuania, Western Latvia, just give up some land, right? Yeah. Uh, and get peace. But yeah. his comrades on Sobnarkom said, no way, we're not doing that. <laughs> okay. So uh, in February, when time ran out, February 1918, the Germans invaded again. Fuck. They took more land. And so the Bolsheviks, actually, next time they met in the Sobnarkom, they still argued. But Lenin was able to convince them by threatening to resign if they didn't agree. He was able to <laughs> convince them to accept the new terms, which were even worse. Like they gave up more land. Oh, shit. That sucks. Uh, but he was like, we got to, dude. We got to, we got to get out of this. And yeah, that was like the one thing we promised. <laughs> yeah. So that leads to the Brest-Litovsk Treaty. Okay. March 3rd, 1918. And so the war, you know, is officially over at that point for Russia. Mm-hmm. Another thing that happens for the Soviets is how they're going to set up the government. And one of the big problems they had uh, was an election was coming up. Oh, shit. <laughs> so this is weird, but it's like a holdover from the provisional government. They were going to have elections in later in November. Mm -hmm. And Lenin was like, that's bullshit. We don't need to elect this con constituent assembly because like, that's from the old government. We don't want yeah, that. We're it's not using that anymore. Yeah, it's dumb. It's bourgeois. Who cares? The Soviets should have all the power anyway. You know, they by now they're meeting in the All Russian Congress of Soviets, which is just like all the different Soviets. You know, they send delegations mm -hmm. or whatever. Okay. Uh, but his comrades on Sovnarkom said, "No, we want the elections." But why? I that was who you fought against. I think they just thought it would, you know, it would work out. It would look good for them. It did not. Like it would make it look like they're anti-democracy or something? I guess. I mean, but I really couldn't like, find what their thinking on that was. That's like us overthrowing Congress and putting like a parliament in there and be like, no, we also still want Congress. <laughs> like, or, Yeah. Or campaigning on abolishing the Senate and then being like, I don't know. Let's let them stay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like that's very weird. Yeah. But the, I mean, they hold the election. Okay. It gets outvoted, you know, so they hold the vote and the Bolsheviks lose badly. They get a quarter <laughs> oh, no. of the vote. 
Uh, and so the Constituent Assembly, they meet in January 1918. What are they going to do? Well, they, they think they're going to be like the governing body. You know? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. And the Bolsheviks show up and they say, hey, are you, you, know, you going to endorse our program? They try to get a law passed that <laughs> strips the body of all of its powers pretty much. <laughs> And so we they're like, this thing that gets rid of you. Yeah. And they're like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, and so Lenin, you know, they call another meeting of the Sobnar come and he's like, these guys, they suck, dude. We shouldn't have done this. We mm -hmm. need to get, you know, we need to get these guys out of here. And he convinces them. They, they agree to disband the assembly by force if necessary. Uh, and so the red guard shows up and ask them to leave they don't they end up like just cutting the lights to the place and then people do leave by like 5 30 in the morning and then they just bar <laughs> entry the next day they're just wow. like you're not coming back wow that's that's some rookie shit so like yeah i was thinking about this because people will typically say oh you know the election didn't go his way so he disbanded this thing which you know does on his face look anti-democratic mm -hmm. but like you were saying it's kind of superfluous if you already got another thing yeah, and like the Soviets were democratic, right? They were more democratic, yeah. Yeah. Um, at that time, you still had a bunch of different factions and stuff too, like multiple, essentially, parties within the Soviets. So, mm -hmm. But still, they were elected positions. It wasn't just like him yeah, and his correct. buds. I mean, like his buds were there, but they also got elected. Right, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's silly. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, so in, oh, in January 1918, Lenin survived an assassination attempt. Oh, man. A comrade of his jumped in the way kind of and took the bullet. Oh. He would later survive another assassination attempt that same year in August by Fanny Kaplan. Okay. Who was a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party who claimed that Lenin had betrayed the revolution. <gasps> and so she shot him. Shit. And uh, the government reinstated the death penalty. <gasps> Just for uh, her? So they could kill her and then continue to use the death penalty <laughs> after that. Which is something oh, that Lenin shit. had always kind of wanted. He didn't really agree mm. with getting rid of it. But they had Bummer. actually abolished it on day one, I think. Or the provisional oh. government did that, actually. Oh, okay. Lenin wanted to bring it back. Damn. Because he's ruthless. Uh, let's see. <laughs> In March 1918, the Bolsheviks changed their party name. <laughs> okay, another new name. Let's hear. All right, so they were Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Uh-huh. They become Russian Communist Party. Okay, they just used our name generator. Hey, it's better, though. It's shorter. <laughs> it's shorter. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that happens. I assume Lenin's kind of a part of that. Uh, on July 10th, 1918, the Congress of Soviets, they ratify a new constitution. Cool. So they formally, uh, this is like the new constitution for all of Russia. That's just, this is when they get their longer name, more annoying name. <laughs> they formally recognize the working class as the ruling class of Russia. That's great. They organize workers and peasants into a red army. Okay. Which at the time was just necessary because of the ongoing civil war, mm. which we'll get into here. And they uh, put supreme power in the hands of the Congress of Soviets we were talking about. Okay. So kind of making it official that we don't, we don't need that other <laughs> thing. We have this and it works yes. well. Thanks. <laughs> uh, however, in practice at this point, you start to see that the communist party basically ends up being in de facto control of the country, even though you, you know, for a while you still have kind of the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries Mm -hmm. and everything they get uh expelled from the party and from the soviets effectively kind of outlawing them oh so that sucks that's the point at which the soviets lose a bit of their democratic element because you can no longer be from those other factions so did they just like vote to do that though um it at that well i guess at that point it would have been a vote by the Congress, so mm -hmm. yeah. but they had a majority there, so they could just be like, right. So off. yeah, it would just be like if Congress today said got rid of one of their parties, they were just like, <laughs> nope, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Weird. Yeah. Uh, but they do that, and like we said, this is uh kind of jumping back and forth here a little bit because we're going to cover now the Civil War. Okay. 
We've talked about this before, Mm -hmm. uh, but I kind of want to cover what Lenin's part here is uh, in it, but I'll I'll summarize. Yeah. So basically, right after the Bolsheviks take power in the October Revolution, the Russian Civil War breaks out. Can I give a Christine's dummy summary, TM? Yeah, please do. It's (laughs) probably not more than mine. (laughs) I mean, people, the nobles are pissed, their lands are getting taken, so they fight back, and it's the white army versus the red army, right? Yeah. Uh, you also have the, the black army. Oh, yeah. I knew there was The anarchists uh, and the green army, the peasants. Okay. Okay. And you also have some foreign armies come in, too. Which <laughs> Just sucks. for fun. Uh, but yeah, you have these various groups. It's, you're right. It's mainly whites versus the red army. Mm-hmm. The, the other alliances can sometimes be shifting and stuff, but it's a big mess. <laughs> yeah, lots of people die, lots of famines. It's it's a bad time. It really is. Um, the government's trying to hold on to control of where it has and also expand that to these kind of rebelling places. The, the government's more in charge in like in, in Moscow and Petrograd and, and the surrounding mm-hmm. areas. And then the, the per- peripheries are kind of where the whites and other groups are. Uh, Lenin put Trotsky in charge of building up the Red Army. Cool. He said, Trotsky's the organized guy. He'll do this right. He makes the decision, I assume par- partially with Sovnarkom too, uh, to allow officers from the old Tsarist army to serve. But <laughs> Trotsky is like, I don't trust these guys. He yeah. sets up like a like a political kind of monitoring system of them. So he's, oh got my like, gosh. he's got political officers in all of his places to answer to him to make sure that he doesn't have any like reactionary guys out there. Wow, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like um, why bother hiring them? Like that's crazy. I mean, I guess you really needed people. The thing was for experience, I think, that these guys actually mm-hmm. knew what they were doing. Lenin, we have mentioned that uh, the Romanov family, the old Tsar mm-hmm. and his family were executed mm-hmm. in July 1918. Lenin, we don't know if he sanctioned the execution beforehand, if he was like, mm-hmm. "Hey, kill him," you know. Yeah. But I would argue that even if he didn't, he definitely agreed with it. Yeah, he was fine with it. <laughs> you know, he, I mean, he's, he's pretty hardcore. I don't think he'll, he would be yeah. like, oh, no, please <laughs> spare them. Yeah. Uh, so. Unlikely. Yeah. Even if he didn't get the chance to sign off on it, he would have. So He would have been fine with it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. After the treaty. Oh, this is a, a real blunder here. Uh, after the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, so mm-hmm. the peace treaty. Where they gave Germany shit. Yeah. Soviet troops move into Poland as the German troops are kind of retreating. They're just like, we're going to take this now. Thanks. <laughs> Excuse me. And this ends up developing into the Polish-Soviet war. Oh, I think that's a bad one, right? It doesn't end up good. No, uh, this is a, t- a super totally mistake. First of all, you were out there saying peace. Mm-hmm. Land and bread and i mean i get that you have a civil war going on so you're already at war but like why do this yeah this one seems unnecessary and it also fails it's <laughs> it goes badly mm. okay. they they fight off the the polish offensive lenin recommends going ahead to invade poland again like you know they start out with that but then they get driven back into their territory and then once they make it even again lenin's like let's go in for the kill gosh Bad recommendation. He thought that they would be greeted as liberators. He thought that the Polish uh, <laughs> proletariat would rise up in rebellion and help them. Did not happen. That did not happen. And they ended up suing for peace and losing more land to Poland. Shit. Sucks. So everybody makes mistakes, I guess. <laughs> as far as the Civil War goes, Lenin ends up helping to lead the Bolsheviks to victory by 1923. Really by late 1921, most of the major stuff had started to get better. So okay. the next part that I want to talk about kind of is the cost of doing that. And this kind of gets into Lenin's more ruthless side, his more dark side. Oh, good. <laughs> Let's hear he's, it. He's all about winning, man. He, he, whatever the cost, he's all about the revolution, the people, socialism, communism. He's not going to be stopped. All right. I mean, he's already up to two strikes with me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, It's about to get worse. (laughs) (laughs) So here's an example of him being ruthless. Uh, When Russia starts facing food shortages in 1918, Mm -hmm. he blames this on the kulaks, the wealthier peasants. Yeah. People who hire out other, you know, peasants to work their land. Oh, okay. And he said, you know, these guys were hoarding grain 
that they're supposed to be given to the government to feed people. Mm -hmm. And so he sets up these committees of poor peasants to go round up that grain. Ooh, okay. And these are set up to be these kind of like local groups, but they end up kind of being just completely violent and, and, and like sort of small state sanctioned mafias kind of going around extorting, extorting these people. Okay. Not great. And not only kulaks, but also like kind of, you know, just all other peasants and stuff, just getting it however yeah. they can. Yeah. It gets out of control. <laughs> yeah. And he ends up, you know, basically realizing this mistake and abolishing these later. Uh, but, you know, set it into motion first, which was not a good idea. Not great. Not a lot of foresight there. Um, and all the while he was calling for terroristic violence against these kulaks, against any opponents, really. Oof, okay. Uh, you know, his argument was they're in a civil war. The ends justify the means. Okay. Not great. So so he orders, uh, for example, in, in a letter to some of his subordinates, he sends orders to them to uh, to hang some of the kulaks as an example to the others. Jesus, okay. Uh, he ordered speculators, black marketeers, and looters to be shot. Okay, but like he also sanctioned his own looters, but whatever. Well, yeah, but now he's, you know, in charge. <laughs> but now he's in charge, so it's not looting. Okay. Um, and his justification, he said... The state is an institution built up for the sake of exercising violence. Previously, this violence was exercised by a handful of money bags over the entire people. Now we want to organize violence in the interests of the people. Ugh, that's a stretch, man. You were saying earlier that it's not so bad with the dictatorship of the proletariat, though. That's the state going after the class enemies. Ugh, I guess. It's not all. Well, I mean, I guess you could. You could. If you have nice enough opponents, right? You could mm -hmm. set up like a discussion group, a discussion <laughs> battalion, even <laughs> send them out there to convince everyone why they should join yeah. your, your group. You can threaten people and then not do the <laughs> not do it. <laughs> this is bluff. I don't know that that would be his defense. Um, sure, I guess it's it's all right. All right. I don't want to downplay what he's doing here, though. He's, I mean, because <laughs> he also sets up a secret police force called the Cheka. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. He, uh, That's strike three for me. That's the official strike three. The other ones, I'm like, three. okay, I'll let you pass. You can try to invade Poland or whatever. So but these guys one. were there to help carry out the repression against the enemies of the revolution. Bummer. Which is also something he said openly that he was going to do earlier. I don't know. Yeah, I guess. That doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> True. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. He also starts something called the Red Terror. Okay. Where lots of people were killed by the Cheka. That's bad. Former czarist administrators, anti-Bolsheviks, any sort of enemies don't have trials or anything. You just, you know, kill them. Mm. There's no, no real good records there of, of how many people died. There's a very wide range from 10,000 to the upper number is by kind of an... <laughs> anti-communist source so i don't even know but it's, it's not in the bajillions or anything but one hundred forty thousand. still bad <laughs> but yeah ten thousand is still kind of a lot of people to kill that's a lot of people <laughs> uh, but i mean if you're a rebel uh, all right do you like what do you do dress them up in uniform send them out in the battlefield so you kill them in battle and like therefore it's not so bad like if you're advocating if you think that the revolutionary path to socialism is a thing mm -hmm. more than that are probably going to die in it unless you're lucky yeah yeah. Well, I guess my thing is, I don't know, like he was already in power. Could he not? I guess he couldn't just like throw him into prison or something. Not that I'm pro prison, but like Fair he didn't enough. have the manpower, I'm sure, to like keep all those prisons going. This is like in Snowpiercer where mm -hmm. they capture their guys and you're like, no, you got to kill your prisoners. It's true. I am on the record for killing prisoners. <laughs> it was two prisoners then, so it wasn't so bad. But then when you, you know, if you, if he said, uh, hey, you're going to be my secret police. When we get mm -hmm. prisoners, kill them. Then you would be like, hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. But okay. At, on the other hand, I think that you're, I don't know, it's its a very good sympathy to be like, uh, fucking killing people, really? That sucks, right? It sucks, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> Did you know it's cool to be anti-killing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I, mm. I see how people justify it, but it's still fucked up. Like, yeah, because it's very contextual, too, because like, he is in the middle of a civil war where like, Multiple countries have invaded him and stuff, and like what all countries invaded? Uh, the United States for one, Britain. Oh shit! Um, yeah, I didn't know we were in. So there. basically, the Allies from uh, oh from World War One, when Russia dropped out, 
they were like, oh, fuck, like Germany is going to come in here and take all this shit, all this uh -huh. material that we sent them and stuff. So they came in. And then the British were just also like, why don't we just kill this whole crazy Bolshevik thing? <laughs> While um, we're here. Yeah. I don't like the way this sounds. And uh, so, yeah, no, I mean, that was happening at the same time that they were fighting the, mm. the broader civil war. Shit. I don't know. I think that's important context not to necessarily justify definitely not every killing, but even mm -hmm. broadly as a, as a concept. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't excuse it, but it gives more context. That's, that's good. Well, the whites were doing this too. It was called a white terror, similar okay. death tolls, also gruesome. Lenin issued a decree in April, 1919 to establish the forerunner to the gulag, which was just like concentration camps for enemies of the state, basically. Prisons. Aww. So there, there are some prisons. <laughs> oh, good. Prisons. <laughs> prisons complete with, uh, you know, slave labor and stuff. Regular prison stuff. Yeah, yeah. By October 1923, they had 315 camps in Russia with 70,000 prisoners. That's a lot. He kept in place the old policy of exiling or deporting uh, anti-Bolshevik intellectuals. So, like, you know, just young versions of his former self, but on the <laughs> wrong side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah ruthless mm -hmm. did anything to if he thought it would further the revolution or the defense Damn. of the revolution at that point i mean like you said you know we shouldn't really be surprised <laughs> given his track record he's been That's... saying it since day one pretty much <laughs> he, he walked the walk uh let's see another big mistake of lenin's was trying to spark revolutions across europe mm, okay this is in line with, I mean, the theory and that we're going to get mm -hmm. a world revolution, right? Yeah. It just wasn't the right time in any of these places. Yeah. Um, it's just all over these various, like, short-lived communist governments in Europe. Psh, they just, they get beat immediately, yeah. pretty much. And that's, I don't know, that's a mistake because, like, that was just money poured down the drain, man. Yeah, you're kind of busy right now. <laughs> and then from their point of view, people are, like, dying, you know, trying mm -hmm. to carry out these crappy revolutions yeah russia like we mentioned faced a terrible famine mm -hmm. in 1921 as well which we've discussed before this is the one where the uh, americans send aid the american like relief fund they send a bunch of they send a bunch of food their way uh-huh lenin was really suspicious of this but he did accept it he had it closely monitored to make sure they weren't doing any bullshit capitalism stuff i guess okay <laughs> they weren't like sneaking in like I don't even know what you would sneak in. Yeah. Uh, a banker hidden in a hedge or something. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> yeah. They snuck in some job creators. <laughs> he endorsed a call by the Orthodox Church uh, for them to sell unnecessary stuff to help feed people. Uh, he took it to the next level by forcibly appropriating all their value valuables in February of <laughs> 1922. Okay. Apparently, their charity was not quite up to snuff, <laughs> which is fair. That's funny. If you give a if you give a mouse a cookie, if you give a priest a gold thing. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to the famine, he faced a lot of peasant uprisings around Russia, which the army went out and put down. Why were the peasants uprising? I mean, probably because they're fucking hungry. When they're hungry, they were getting you know grain taken from them, you know, appropriate. I mean, that's fair. And the country was really in a pretty dire place by this point. Yeah. So in February, nineteen twenty one. Lenin introduced the New Economic Policy. Mm, okay, I've heard about this one. Yeah, it's also called the NEP. Okay. Uh, and the short story is kind of that it introduces some capitalism back. Mm, yeah. But in researching it, I kind of understood a little better, mm, at least the justification for it. Okay. Because what Lenin argued was that during the Russian Civil War, they kind of went off course and they had to resort to what he calls war communism which is just where they're outright, you know, appropriating things, just taking mm -hmm. stuff, right? They're outright conscripting people to do labor. They're outright just having to do whatever they can to make sure people have enough. Yeah, that makes sense. Because they're just struggling to survive. Yeah. But now he says we can get back to kind of what we were trying to do. The worst is almost over, you know, and we can allow for some private enterprise to come back. We can allow for a little bit of a wage system, a little bit of an open market with taxes and stuff and make sure everybody, you know, is provided for socially, but we're going to allow kind of market forces to develop a little more. Okay. 
And so, I don't know, it kind of made sense to me in that, in that regard, in that, like, if you look at what they were doing before as emergency measures, right? Mm -hmm. Then this makes a little more sense in terms of what we were talking about with Engels' theory of developing your productive forces. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, in a alternate universe where there wasn't a civil war, maybe they would have tried that first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, and, and it's not complete capitalism either. The state is still heavily involved. It holds on to like the, the, the main utilities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The commanding heights of the economy, it still kind of directs things. It's just a better way, he argues, it's a better way to move forward, I guess, economically. Okay. And besides that, people seem to credit it with keeping the government from being overthrown. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. That's important. Yeah. Uh, finally, we get to kind of the latter part of Lennon's life. Okay. In 1921, in the latter, latter half of that, he gets real sick, suffering from hyperacusis, insomnia, and headaches. Oh. Takes a leave of absence. Lots of doctors are tending to him, trying to figure out what's wrong. They can't really. Uh, he ends up suffering a stroke in May Oof. of 1922. Okay. And another one in December. Damn. Yeah, so he's struggling at that point. He's trying to keep up with politics still, still kind of calling the shots, sort of. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and as much as he as much as he can, I suppose. In December of 1922 and in January of 1923, he may or may not have dictated a document called Lenin's Testament. Okay. Historians are not quite sure if this is authentic. Okay. And it's juicy stuff, so <laughs> that kind of explains why uh this is where he does a lot of trash talking especially about stalin oh interesting yeah so he says stalin is um is terrible he says he should be removed from the position of general secretary of the communist party i mean not the wrong reason was he says is stalin is too crude and this defect, which is entirely acceptable among us and in relationships here with communists, becomes unacceptable in the position of general secretary. Damn. Okay. So he says, you know, they should, you know, figure out how to get him out. You know, he can still be in the party, but like he shouldn't be in charge. Interesting. So people think it's fake because it's like kind of convenient that he would, you know, end up saying shit about a guy who turned out to be pretty awful. Pretty awful, but also pretty, uh, well, you know, in charge of your main, like, geopolitical opponent. You know, if it's mm -hmm. a fabrication of, of someone or another, then it makes sense for them to want to do that to kind of discredit him. Or from domestic opponents, people who don't like Stalin in Russia might might come up with that and say, look, Lenin didn't like him. He's illegitimate. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. And uh, it it's funny. It, it kind of endorses Trotsky as the as who should take over after, but it he also shit talks Trotsky in there too. He's like, Trotsky's kind, <laughs> kind of an sucks, asshole. But... He's kind of arrogant and stuff, but like he'll, he'll be pretty good. <laughs> I feel like he would be. I don't know. He seems cool. Uh, he's in, uh, mm, He would kill back... just as many people. Shit. <laughs> he, they, these guys were, were, he didn't really have many softies around there. Guess not. But anyway, disputed. So I don't, I don't really know if okay. I believe one way or the other, honestly. Uh, Interesting. It's plausible to me. Yeah. While Lenin is out sick, Stalin starts kind of trying to consolidate his power, uh, trying to make it seem like he's, you know, the closest mm -hmm. guy. He deserves to be the successor. He eventually ends up being in control of who has access to Lenin. Uh, and so, you know, this is also why it's plausible because he just could be getting annoyed at Stalin, <laughs> seeing him more often and just being like, this guy, I can't stand him. <laughs> Too close. They ended up, Stalin and Lenin, having this disagreement closer to the end of his life where uh, they were arguing about the new government they were going to form in, in the new constitution, the Soviet Union is what it would be called. Mm, okay. Stalin wanted to kind of annex all these different uh, ethnic states, uh, non-Russian, you know, basically nations. He wanted to annex yeah. them into a bigger, a, an overall Russian socialist Russia. state. Yeah. Yeah. And Lenin was like, no, dude, that's like nationalist. Like, you can't do that. Like, let them be do their own thing. If they want to join us in like kind of a union with like a bunch of different nations, like Russia and then them and then them and then all mm -hmm. part of like the union of, I don't know, Soviet socialist republics. <laughs> Just spitball. We can do that. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Stalin eventually agreed. He convinced him, you know. And so that's what they did. That was the new 
that's what the new constitution cool uh, brought were about. there countries that wanted to join um yeah i mean you had countries where there were like communist parties doing their thing they were mm -hmm. to some degree in some in places like russian dominated uh, okay but like ethnically you mean or in terms of the leadership oh uh, okay so they went out there and, and started some shit yeah okay cool cool uh and then in march 1923 lennon suffered a third stroke uh and kind of his health starts rapidly declining at that point he in january 21st 1924 he falls into a coma and that he never recovers from he dies later oh. that day damn yep how old was he so that would put him at 54. That's really young. Yeah. Um, he'd lived a life constantly running from the cops, I guess. Um, <laughs> a lot of stress. Yeah. <laughs> and constantly uh, arguing with people, too. So <laughs> Yeah. Starting shit. Don't start shit. You'll die young. Uh, yeah. All right. So we've reached the end of yeah. Roland's life. That was a lot, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a ton. I think I was really struck by, like I mentioned this earlier, but like my preconception of him as like basically doing the whole revolution instead of like leading it. Like he had a slightly different role than I imagined, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting. And I don't know. I just, I mean, the Russian civil war is very complicated. <laughs> so yeah. like the fact that like he was away for like some of that first stuff, I thought that was very, like kind of funny. Like he just comes in later. Yeah. It's, um, it goes, like you said, it goes against what you, what your common conception of it is, which this was all Lenin, right? Uh, Lenin mm -hmm. did pretty much all of it. Um, he was, like you said, an important figure. Yeah. But he was also doing his own, you know, being a person, part of a broader revolutionary movement, I guess. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So we've covered a lot. Mm -hmm. What are some, we, we just covered this part, I guess. So what are some of the biggest downsides for you about Lenin? Um, well, I mentioned earlier I had strikes, so I'm, I'm going back in my memory. The first strike, I think, for me was the, the Freedom of the Press one. That one, that one was a little sus. I didn't like that. <laughs> okay. I gave him a pass on Poland, which I shouldn't have. I was trying to be nice. <laughs> was... I, I mean, didn't like all the killings he did, but like, again, we talked about that justification and... Yeah, you were still against it, though. You still don't like I'm it. I'm still against it. Okay. Yeah. That's still a strike for you. It's still a strike. Anti-killing. Give, give an honest, you know, an honest evaluation okay. from okay, your yeah. perspective. I didn't like all the killing. Oh, and the he did something that was like anti-democratic at one point that I didn't like. Banning the parties? It? No, it was the secret police. That was, that was well, the other yeah, you didn't like that either. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Anti-killing, anti-police. I think those are good. And for, for free press, I think those are good values. <laughs> I stand by that. All right. Makes sense. So yeah, th those things could use some improvement, Lenny. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the resurrection. She's back. I would add a couple of kind of flaws of his are being an asshole, <laughs> being re like really petty, really disparaging. Like he goes after Very people petty. when he's when he's pissed at them. You know. I almost didn't count that because so much of that is familiar to what we've read about other, what we've learned about other leftist parties is that they're just all petty bitches. Like they love a <laughs> flame war. They love, you know, kicking people out of the party and arguing over, should it be big? Should it be small? I don't know. He actually, like, uh, he wrote to one of his, one, some friend of his when he was about to attend a party conference and he was like, you should show up. This is going to be, you know, basically this is going to be a shit show. You should show up. <laughs> I'm going to start some shit. Will you be there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he basically did that. No, I, I, I think that that's comes from him being so absolutist about things. So mm -hmm. like, you know, passionate and kind of zealous for uh, you know, the revolution above all, he thinks he's right. You know what I mean? And so he's gonna, he's gonna go out there and take down people who aren't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that is his main big flaw is that he's like, I'll fucking kill people for this. Here's another one though. Mm. I think that's reasonable. I think that, um, given that he's so dedicated, it makes sense for him to be so angry about it. And this is similar is, uh, given that he has to be so paranoid mm -hmm. about the state coming after him. He learns to be very secretive, very, you know, kind of clandestine, keep his cards close to his chest. And it's a great tactic when you're trying to evade the czar's secret police. Yeah. Riding in milk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, what, is, what does it end up leading to? Because this continues. It ends up leading to a more closed party membership or party leadership. That's how you get 
secret police. And you end up with secret police. You end up kind of with the instability once he dies of like, okay, well, you know, Stalin ends up taking power and solidifying that for himself. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a product of something that makes total sense, but still ends up being kind of a downside. Yeah, yeah. And I think we've talked about this before, just the nature of that secret. And if, yeah, it works great at the beginning, doesn't work so hot once you're in there. And I guess, I guess transparency becomes more important once you're in charge and like a true democracy. And I think, I think that's where we get the image of Russia as like a dictatorship. Like this is the start of it is one guy was really secretive. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. All right. So we, you know, offered some critiques, <laughs> kind of mean, but what were his good sides? What did you like about Lenin? Hmm. I mean, I liked all those like edicts he passed at the beginning. I thought those were good. Mm -hmm. And I liked, I mean, it's stupid. It's the the things I don't like him are also the things I like about him, you know? Yes. uh, I'm the same (laughs) way for sure. What are yours? Um, The, I don't like how he did it, but Mm -hmm. redistributing food during a famine. That's what you should fucking do when there's a famine. Like Mm -hmm. maybe don't like sanction fucking gangs to do it, but. Yeah, true. (laughs) <laughs> but also, it's like, well, what's the alternative? If, if you don't want fucking police, pol- police are bad. So, like, in theory, it makes sense to hire a local militia and be like, the people are in charge of distributing grain. But like, I don't know, are they the people end up working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They could also be shitty. So, yeah, he's just a double-edged sword all around, huh? Yeah, I agree. Like, because my pros are how meticulous he is, man. He's 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 hyper careful. He's paranoid about getting caught and that's so useful for him because like he is getting chased you know it's Mm -hmm. he's able to not 100 percent, but he's able to (laughs) you know stave off capture a lot of times he's super dedicated uh he's incredibly hard working he's you know like we said kind of zealous in his pursuit of the revolution and his defense of marxism like he's all about that he's 100 percent I was thinking today, like just doing this research, I'm like, man, I'm nothing like Lennon. I'm too fucking lazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm also very lazy. So, And I don't know. I, in some ways, do admire that he was always willing to do whatever it takes. Yeah. Like my, one of his high points for me was when he got rid of that like pseudo Congress or whatever. He's like, no, we don't need this one. Like we got our own thing. It's worker led. Like just fucking trust me. And like, I think that takes a lot of guts because I think- it would be very tempting. And like, that's exactly what happened. That's why they had the Duma because, you know, your initial reaction on saying this, this system is bad. Let's try to change it. That doesn't always work. And it often backfires. So like, I think it's very ballsy just to be like, no, we don't fucking need this provisional government. Yeah. Let's do something new. We can move past that. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, he's, he's willing to take those actions for him. The ends justified the means, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and he, I don't know, man, I put this out in my pros column is that I've, he realized that when you're in a revolution, there's not really room for moral qualms. Yeah, that's and true. I, okay. I'm probably more like you in this sense in that when it's me in that situation, <laughs> I don't know that I could do it. And maybe that's oh, why yeah, I no. admire him like that he was able to do that because it is terrible things there's this quote i want to give you this is from lincoln steffens who was a like a reporter guy i guess Mm -hmm. uh, who said when i asked lennon officially about the terror referring like to the red terror in the civil war he whirled on me fiercely who wants to ask us about our killings he demanded paris i said meaning as he well understood the peace conference Mm. and lennon says do you mean to tell me that those men who have just generaled the slaughter of 17 millions of men in a purposeless war are concerned over the few thousands that have been killed in a revolution, which has as a conscious aim to get out of the necessity of war and an armed peace? Yeah. And he stood for a moment, facing me with his blazing eyes, then quieting down, he said, But never mind, do not deny the terror. Do not minimize any of the evils of a revolution. They occur. They must be counted upon. If we have to have a revolution, we have to pay the price of it. Yeah. I mean, in a way that makes sense, like when you think about the Bolsheviks' anti-war stance, like that must mean they would only go to war when they really fucking need to go to war, you know? Like, yeah. And I mean, they later do when it's, when, when it's, it's Nazis, Nazis, which is the literal most evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to. So, ah, interesting. 
Yeah. Okay. And, you know, obviously he does some self-serving uh, minimizing <laughs> He's of trying a, to cover a, few, his ass a, a few thousand. <laughs> Just a few. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think is, that's quite right, but okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a little generous. Some low balling. But I don't know. Uh, to me, yeah. this is like, I guess I just uh, admire that he did get the revolution done. It, you know, as we said, not wholly him, but mm -hmm. his movement, his party based mm -hmm. on his organization. Yeah. And his theory, too. Yeah. They got a revolution writing. done in czarist Russia, not in some developed capitalist <laughs> country, but in czarist Russia. And not only that, but he then successfully leads the only socialist country in the world through a massive civil war and foreign invasion. That's a good point. Like, if he truly bought into Marx, like, 100%, wouldn't he be like, oh, we're not capitalists. Like, we still got serfs. I got to wait. Yeah. Like, in the in orthodox Marxism, as we call it, if he hadn't mm -hmm. um, kind of added his own. Yeah. Interp and, uh, he also argued that, like, Russia had some capitalism, so it was okay to kind of jump to trying to do socialism. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they didn't have, by that point, they had had the emancipation of the serfs. So you did have a lot of peasants didn't technically mm -hmm. have any feudal lords or whatever but but no like very early capitalism though right and he definitely made some advances or deviations if you don't like them uh from orthodox <laughs> marxism from marx as he inherited it and that's why you have mm -hmm. kind of like his big idea being leninism which is just kind of the theories we've been talking about so far yeah yeah because he wrote that thing being like actually yeah let's use these peasants they seem useful <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah which is mark said they were backwards and he said no so interesting that's yeah. very interesting yeah i keep thinking about too again i'm thinking about stereotypes the stereotype of like oh you know there's so much corruption in communism and i think that again comes from that secrecy and that kind of very closed off guarded way of governing mm -hmm. but and like there definitely was that like don't fucking get me wrong but i still go back to the fact that like well a lot of people don't know what the fucking word soviet means which is a workers council <laughs> like, yeah that's very cool and we should have those for sure yeah <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> <laughs> so all right we've got the pros we've got the cons mm -hmm. uh not necessarily a grade but like i don't know you could do a star rating Okay. Or okay. like, what do you, where do you come down on this Lenin guy? I like him less than I liked Shay. Okay. <laughs> How about that? I can give him a ranking in comparison to other people we've talked about. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked Emma Goldman. So he's probably below her too. Just a little too violent because she was so consistently anti-war that really jived with me. Yeah. So yeah, star rating, I give him a, a 3.5. 3.5. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Wouldn't watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I like him. I have not done enough reading to know because remember, I was like, maybe I'm a Leninist or a you know, Marxist mm, yeah, Leninist yeah. or something. Yeah. What's the conclusion? I haven't done enough reading to, to guarantee that. I definitely appreciate his theoretical like advances. I think those are cool. Yeah. The imperialism shit. Yeah. That was my shit right Imperial, there. Yeah. That me too. That one. I mean, not that I like imperialism. I love Imperial imperialism. Yeah, but. No, imperialism sucks. No. Yeah. That's our motto. It is. It's not our motto. We end with our motto, but... <laughs> it's been cross-stitched, so it basically is our motto. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I... Where do I rate him? Yeah. So I don't your star? completely adopt his ideology, but I appreciate it. And mm -hmm. may in the future dabble in it more. We'll see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As far as the star rating goes, I think that I am more appreciative of the results. short The short-term results, I should say, because, you know, uh, ultimately all roads lead to Stalin, but... Yeah, that's a bad one. But I just, that's shh, October Revolution, man. Like, that's a big crazy fucking deal. to get done. And <laughs> winning the Civil War after that. And I don't know, that ranks highly for me. I'm going to give him four stars. All right. That's totally fair. Yeah, I almost gave him a four. I get it. Four stars. You know, good with the bad. That's still really good, in my opinion. And yeah, I think he's earned it. Just the dedication, man. Yeah, yeah. Definitely had that. All right, so that was a lot. It was. <laughs> Hope you learned something there, but I'm curious to see. Uh, what do you want to talk about next time? I think it's been about time for another listener Q&A. Sounds good. Sounds good. Let's do that. Yeah. I run the socials. I've been taking lots of screenshots, so I think we got enough of them. Excellent. So we probably have enough questions for this episode, but if you want to send us more for a future episode, we usually get to all of them, so... 
Yeah, we'll try anyway. <laughs> so if you do want to send us an email with a question, suggestion, comment, compliment, any of those things are welcome. Shoot us an yeah. email at teachmecommunism at gmail.com. If you want to get in touch with us on social media, we are at Teach Communism on Twitter, at Teach Me Communism on Instagram, and we are also on YouTube if you want to watch our episodes there. Heck yeah. Listen to. We don't record our faces. So that'd be bad. Sure. But you can watch like our album art. <laughs> you can just stare at it. <laughs> <laughs> you can also, you can and you should also. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Even if you're on an Apple user, you can still leave a review there. It really helps people find the show. So that would be great if you can do that. Rate and review. And finally, yeah. we have a Patreon. Uh, Patreon.com slash Teach Me Communism. If you donate $5 a month, you get access to our episode notes. I have no notes for this episode because I was lazy this week. So these will be Grady's notes. Yeah. Uh, but you can find my notes for previous episodes. So. <laughs> And if you donate to the Patreon, or it's not really donating because you're getting stuff, if you pay for the Patreon, <laughs> then we will donate these funds to a mutual aid network in the area. We're still solidifying who we want to choose, but yeah, working on that. Yep. All right. Well, I do want to thank you for being a great student today. There was a lot to thank learn. You for doing, thank you for doing so much fucking research. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, living and breathing Lennon all this week, so. <laughs> Did you dream as him? Yes, first person dreams. <laughs> I was shit talking so many people. Oh, yeah. I was causing all sorts of rivalries to break out. Drama. It was great. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks. That was fun. <laughs> uh, and thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in. You can catch us next week on another episode of Teach Me Communism where the class struggle is always in session. Bye. Bye-bye.